Hello everyone, my name is Carly and welcome to this week's episode of Go Ahead Tell Me. During this new season, we continue to bring inspiring people to the show while also emphasizing the importance of emotional health and tips on how to take care of your emotions. This week's guest is Judah Ray. Judah's journey has been a difficult one, one that may have broken some, but Judah took his life experience and has made the absolute best of it. It is an honor to have Judah here with us today to share his story, but to also share how he has overcome the obstacles he's faced while also learning how to treat his trauma and emotions in a way that allows him to live a life full of love, positivity, and happiness. Judah, thank you so much for being here to share your story with us. So my journey began at a very young age, and that was for a reason. Uh, I come from a very dysfunctional family, um, had a very hard childhood, leading up to pretty much being homeless in my teenage years. And I, at an early, early age, found nightlife and uh, what were called rave parties back in those days. And, you know, I found that very interesting when I was going out to these I I stopped for a second I was like okay wait a second I paid to get in here and it's just a group of people that all showed up in a spot and my brain started working as a producer does I like to say you know putting things together of how you can organize something and bring people together to create something and you know create a profit margin for your investors so Mm -hmm. I was very lucky before I was really at you know, the right age around 15, 16 to find a nightclub that it was one of the last great nightclubs, the Roxbury back in the days. And they had a Wednesday night event that was going there. And some friends of mine brought me in to help promote the place, get the word out, you know, to the younger crowds. They didn't know how old I was exactly. And, uh, (laughs) you know, bring out the flyers to the raves and promote them there. And I would show up every week on Wednesday at you know six o'clock, seven o'clock, because it was also a restaurant during the day. Mm. And I'd help clear all the tables, clear off the dance floor, and get everything ready for the night. And by the time the club would start, I'd already be inside. So I would just you know kick it there all night backstage, be on the DJ, you know, meeting people, doing my thing. I wasn't allowed to leave because if I left, security didn't know who I was, so I wouldn't be able to get <laughs> back into the place. <laughs> so, you know, I made a lot of connects. I met a lot of people and I started, you know, realizing that I knew the big DJs in town because of this club. And I knew, you know, the locations because I'd go out to these events. And I started realizing that I could put one of these together myself. So around 16, 17, I produced my first all night event that went from eight o'clock at night till eight o'clock in the morning. It was, um, you know, dance music and, you know, raves. Straight up rake and warehouse parties back in those early 90s. <laughs> and I had a great time, had a great experience there and made some really good money. So it kind of catapulted me into that world. And I got off the streets and I got my first little studio apartment. It was like a 550 square foot place in, in uh, <laughs> Studio City. This little hole in the wall, but it was mine. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a really good journey. You know, I, I made a lot of good connections. Uh, it started moving through the rave scene and started doing older stuff because I started, you know, aging. So I started doing more nightclubs until, you know, when I got into my later teens and my early 20s, um, started doing like concerts and galas and celebrities' birthday parties and, you know, that whole entire world of entertainment and nightlife. Just, I don't know, it was more trying. It was all I knew really at that time. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? When you come from where I come from and... Um, The background that I came from, which, you know, at those times, I, you know, was part of the whole entire scene. I was, came from a father that was, you know, a drug addict and I fell down that whole entire lifestyle. My mom was in a trailer home. So I was a trailer Mm -hmm. home kid. I was, I was the epitome of everything you could ever want out of an 80s kid that was going down the wrong path. So, but, and I like to say this, I tell people this all the time that it's not where you're from but it's who you are, you know, it's Mm -hmm. about, do you really believe you deserve better than what you have and then what you're doing, especially in those really hard situations, you know, are you a person who's compliant and just, you know, believes that that's best you're going to do and you're a loser and you don't deserve anything because you're a bad person. I mean, those those people exist in this Mm -hmm. world. They really do. You can't Mm -hmm. do nothing about them, but we're not talking about those kind of people. We're talking about most people believe they deserve better believe they can do something better we all have that feeling you know almost almost everyone has that feeling so 
that was kind of aching on me and I was getting older and the, you know, the drug stuff wasn't fun anymore. And the young girls wasn't fun anymore. And I was just growing out of that whole entire thing. But I knew that I still hadn't achieved what I wanted for myself, what I first believed for myself. Cause you know, I was a young kid at one point, like everybody else. And I had dreams and aspirations and wanted to be big things. And then, you know, my life was ripped away from me and mm-hmm. uh, my, my future was ripped away from me. And, Everything was ripped away from me, literally, not just figuratively. I was homeless, as I said. So mm-hmm. I knew that that lifestyle wasn't what I wanted to do, but I also knew that I could produce. I knew that I could bring people together. I knew I could create things. I knew I could create profits for my investors through doing this. I knew I was good at entertaining. And I knew that I loved film. And that's mm-hmm. when I really decided, okay, I got my first chance. I left the club scene. I started working on sets as a PA for free. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> Going from, um, you know, big club producer, balling up in Hollywood Hills, the greatest of parties and all this stuff. to so being the bottom ring, you know, going into the <laughs> mail room uh, as, a, as, as a temp and as a uh, intern pretty much. But like I said, I knew I knew what I wanted to do. I had heard this story back then, which always resonated with me about this tennis player. The tennis player always got third and second place, right? But they knew that they could do first. They knew that they got their game right. They loved tennis. They could get to first. And so they had to develop this new skill. But they knew if they developed this new skill that they would win first. It's like this new skill was an awesome skill. And they knew it would solidify learning this new trade or this new technique how to get you know that first place win but the problem is when you start doing something new you know you're not perfect at it and not only that but it's, it starts screwing up what you were doing so this mm-hmm. tennis player starts getting eighth place ninth place and they're like what was i doing i was getting second place people you know silver's not bad people were pretty happy i was happy but <laughs> i knew i could do better and i knew not only could i do better but if i take this new skill set and i do this new thing I feel in my heart, I know I can get first. And so they stayed dedicated to it. And guess what? Eventually, of course, they mastered the skill. That stopped taking away from what they were normally concentrating on. So that skill set was already there. And together, the guy ended up winning first place, got what he wanted. And I always I always dug that. I always, it always stuck with me, that, that story. So Yeah, that's a great started... story and mentality to live with as well. Yeah, it's it's been one of the catalysts to help push me forward, Um, which in this case, into film, I was working for free for, gosh, two or three movies and one music video. And then finally, I was pulled into the art department on a movie with Jesu Garcia and this this cult (laughs) that he worked with that was filming this movie called Spiritual Warrior about their cult beliefs about spiritual war. It is the weirdest thing. (laughs) And I'm working for free for these people. And uh, I'm working in the art department that day. And the art director, by the end of the day, takes me to the producer and says, this guy's working in art for now on. That's when I found the art department. And I was like, okay, cool. Art. I love this. This is great. I mean, I want to be a producer, but I'm learning about set. I'm learning about protocol. I'm getting paid, which is important when you're trying to survive. And you have nothing going on because you come from <laughs> nothing. You know what I mean? So that helps out a lot in a, in a new place, so especially working for free. And uh, started, my first job was I was at the end of that movie and they, the camera truck guy wasn't available. And they said, does anybody want to make $50 a day? And my hand shot up so fast. <laughs> 50 that's, that's pay. Oh, hey, how do they get paid? And I drove over <laughs> the Rocky Mountains in a two and a half ton truck in a weather storm. Oh, that my was like goodness. wind and water. I thought I was going to die. But I oh, made it. my God. And uh, that was my first paid job. And I was like, okay, now I've been paid. I've worked on set. Now I can get paid for working on set. And I, I started taking a lot of set gigs and working everything from art department. And when that wasn't available, I would do hair, wardrobe, makeup. I did crafty. <laughs> I did anything I could get my hands on to get me on a set so I could learn about how that job worked, you know, how grip worked, what a gaffer was, what electric did. I took any job, kind of, you know, I'm a smart guy. I knew how to like, you know, be like, okay, teach me one, teach me something once. I'm going to pay attention and I will learn it, right? So (laughs) boom, 
I was on a set. It was uh, up in Santa Clarita working art department with this, this guy, Michael Popek. And we're driving along in a golf cart back towards set. And we see this old rickety house on the side of the road. And uh, it was like an old set, but they had torn it down. And I go, you know, just give me a house like that. Be so cheap. I can just throw eight people in it, kill them off, do a horror movie. I'm a producer. I want to produce. And he goes, oh, I'm a director. I, I want to direct. And I have a screenwriter friend. We can do this. And we came together and made our first film, One Among Us, uh, which was my first feature. I produced it by myself. And it was psychotically crazy to do. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I didn't come from anything. No one knew me from anything. And here I am. I just took my skills of producing raves where, I mean, come on. With a rave, you get one chance, one night to get your money back. If there's an accident on the way to your event, you're screwed. If the cops come and shut down your event, you're screwed. There's an overdose at your event, you're screwed. There's so many different ways in that one chance. I looked at film and I was like, wait a second. You mean I can maybe get this in theaters. If I don't get theaters, I can get it onto DVD. If I don't get DVD, I can get it in Red, if red Box, not that. Then I can get it into, you know, I had all these outlets you know, that I could mm -hmm. sell this thing. on. so I went back to the, you know, the same investor I was like, Hey, instead of one chance, one shot, you want to try this out? And they all told <laughs> me to screw off. <laughs> I'm not even joking. They all told me like, hell no. <laughs> movies, <laughs> movies back then were the hardest things in the world to make money on. Everyone knew investors knew that you couldn't make money off movies back in those days. This is before streaming and digital video and mm -hmm. Netflix but I made that first <laughs> film and Netflix was in their early days and they bought it. And uh, wow. I, I did really, I did it. And I pulled it off and then it drove me crazy. So I got out of Indy and went to go work for the guy, Eli Samaha, who did like Heat and Boondock Saints. Oh, and wow. I, yeah, I can name a hundred movies he's done. He was dating like Tia Carrera and I went to MGM and worked with him and you know, I saw the real side of the movie industry. I saw the, the corrupt side of it. I had ideas stolen. I saw the ego mm -hmm. in it, which I didn't know about ego at the time and things like that. And I saw just all these elements that just really rubbed me wrong um, into the way of what am I doing? You know, why, why am I doing this to myself? I've driven myself into a wall. I hit my breaking point. I, I, I just, you know, what do they call that when you, you know, your bandwidth is just full and you can't do it anymore. And I, I you know, I, I couldn't do it. And I got out of the whole film industry. I had found a, a nice little inlet. Uh, medical marijuana had just started in California. And I had mm -hmm. found a, a group of people that were willing to sell me uh, one of their medical facilities at the time. And I had just, just enough money left over from selling the film and doing what I did at MGM and I pumped it once again back down to zero threw it all into this shop and went right back down to the bottom again starting something new broke out of my mind but with a dream mm. and uh, medical marijuana was interesting it really was uh, you know the first couple of months I remember like, I think it was seven months in an old man came up to me and was like Judah I was doctor told me I had seven months to live. That was 11 months ago. And the only reason why I'm still here is because of this shop. Blew my mind. Yeah. I was like, okay, yeah. I found my calling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to make an impact in the world. It's what I've always wanted to do. And here I am. Everyone told me when I was a kid, I was, you know, I was kicked out of the Santa Clarita school district, the LA school district. I was kicked out of Santa Barbara school district. I went to probationary Jeez. schools just to graduate high school. I went to like seven different high schools in all because of marijuana, you know, my parents telling me I was going to be a loser when I grew up. Um, and here I was, you know, they were all wrong in like the weirdest <laughs> way that you could ever imagine. <laughs> That's and, incredible. Uh, yeah, rode that wave, which was very nice. And then it, it started going from medical to recreational. Mm -hmm. And once again, you know, I was living in a really great life. I was living up in a penthouse and had a gorgeous actress wife and I had, you know, Mercedes Benzes and employees and all the, the dream that people have. And I was staring out my window over the city from the 12th story of the fucking W hotel. Sorry for cussing. Um, <laughs> I was staring out the window. The tw I was staring out the window of the 12th story of the W hotel, my penthouse. And I, I hated my life. I was depressed. I, mm -hmm. I hated 
I was, I don't, I hate these words. I hated my wife. I hated my business. I hated my employees. Everyone was high all the time. All my employees were high all the time. The cops were threatening to come in all the time. So my day felt, every day felt like I was going to go to jail, lose everything. My mm-hmm. security didn't care. My friends, I couldn't tell who was real, who wasn't. I was being abused in every angle because I was making money. And, you know, my neighbors sucked. They all thought they were cool because they lived at the W. They weren't actually cool people. They just, thought their money or their where they lived and what clubs they could get into made them cool. And I was just living this life that everybody dreams of and everyone mm-hmm. thinks will make them happy until they actually get into it. And you start realizing that we're all programmed to think of this uh, idea of what we're supposed to be and where we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to be and what success is. Um, and that that's, that's where I had the realization that, you know, money didn't make me happy and you can say money makes you happy good for you um money doesn't make me happy uh i was happier when i was broke and homeless on the streets than i was when i was sitting in penthouses in the top of of the upper echelons and Mm. i realized that happiness had to be out there because i'd seen it i'd experienced it and once again i knew that, that i deserved something good i'm a good person I don't mm-hmm. lie. I don't cheat. I don't steal. I don't rob. I don't, I don't do anything that in my eyes can be imagined as a bad person. I try and help people. I give, I love, you know, I'm just 100% pumped the positivity. And so I, I looked at, it, I'm like, okay, Judah, you wanted to make film, but you weren't happy doing it their way. You wanted to be rich, but you're not happy doing it their way. Like all these things is everybody else's way of what's supposed to make you happy. Even what I was dating, who I was dating was an idea of, oh, I'm a producer and I live in a, you know, I'm in this nice place and I have money. So I should be dating a person that looks like this and acts like this and wants these things. And I was so programmed. <laughs> um, it was probably like the, 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 the pinnacle of when I really realized there was a problem that um, it wasn't me, but it had to do with me and that I had to solve what that was and so I started really soul searching I was like okay you love film you love producing you love bringing things together you love learning um go back to school and once again Mm -hmm. I gave everything up I sold all the shops I went back to school to film school in my early 30s and um (laughs) was back at zero again but I took four (laughs) years to finish school I didn't take a job the whole time. I focused on just my studying. So like it was literally school every day, homework at night, homework on the weekends, Uh, 18 to 21 year old kids in my class, hanging out with them after school, watching (laughs) movies, working with them as my filmmaking partners on stuff. And halfway through, I found screenwriting and I I took Mm. a, a directing class and a camera class. And I learned about lenses and how lenses tell stories and how stories are told. And I sat there and I was like, I, I love this. I love how a lens tells a story with an actor because of a script. And I loved it. I, I, I quit. I'm done producing. I'm going to be a creative. <laughs> and literally in the middle of my 30s, spent half of the money that I had saved halfway through school, switched my master's over to creative and started studying as a creative. Wow. And by the end of school, I graduated with, literally I sold all my stocks off. I was broke. I was living in a two-bedroom apartment in, in uh, Hollywood with a, a kid that was 17, eight, no, I think it was like 18 years old, and he rented <laughs> a room for me because I couldn't afford the place by myself. I was broke. <laughs> I was broke. I was like, okay, wait, Judah. You literally just went from being $1.5 million a year to you're broke. You have an 18-year-old <laughs> living in your house who, by the way, tried to strong arm rob me. I mean, I probably went through like 10 roommates in that apartment. Oh, I can't even describe the place I was in. I was divorcing my wife. I was broke. Living in Hollywood. Like, I'm talking about Hollywood and Highland off the boulevard where it's like a thousand people outside your door. (laughs) People are getting shot. It's just like insane over there. I'm like, what? And, and, but here's the thing though. This is, it's a, it's a catalyst because as I was growing in what I wanted to do, I also started growing as a human being. I started looking at myself and looking at, you know, okay, what is happiness? How am I going to find this happiness? I started looking at spirituality more, not religious, um, but religious science more. I started looking into new age thinking more. I started opening up really to, okay, 
let's let's see what all the hype is and all these people are talking about. And um, that's when I started learning about, and I'd heard a million times about ego in my life and don't be egotistical. And, <laughs> you know, oh, ego's bad. Look out, ego. But I started learning <laughs> what ego was and how ego's created and where ego derives from. And I started learning about, you know, the ideas of living in the now and the idea of the observer and me and I and stuff like Eckhart Tolle and, you know, like the secret barely scratches at this whole reality that's out there. And I started looking into all that. And at the same time, I started looking into spirituality, things like, you know, uh, God and Jesus Christ and, you know, all these figures like Buddha and stuff and why they were and who they were, but not in a religious way, but in a scientific way of why do these people talk about these people? What were these people? Mm. Why were they here? You know, were they real? Like stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I just started going down this path of, okay, I've graduated college in my mid thirties. <laughs> I'm completely broke. Um, it's funny. I was watching a 30 rock episode and um, I love that show. I love that show. And they had her <laughs> kind of going through like different kind of ways and trying to find different forms to identify with how to deal with this. And it was just on um, another show that just did it was, um, and it's even more current right now was the Connors. They have Darlene on there trying to do the same thing. You know, she's looking to religion. She's looking to spirituality. And my point being is that through working on myself in these new ways, and I'm talking about, I'll give you an example. So I was brought up from t working at 12 years old. I need to grind. I need to mm -hmm. work hard every single day. I'm not joking you. When I was a so I'm an insomniac naturally. I barely sleep at night. I probably get three to four hours now. I used to sleep one hour a night into Jeez. my late 20s. So I would grind 22-hour days, 23-hour days now. Wow. Yes, I got a lot done. And yes, I achieved a lot in all those years doing that way of working. But I only achieved what I grinded and worked really hard towards. Only in the last decade, especially the last five years, have I learned and it's my mic it's start getting hippie here a little new agey but have i learned <laughs> nothing how wrong to, with that how to release my ego how to step back from myself as an observer how to and this is the biggest key of it how to stop trying to be i'm doing this i'm doing that look what i'm doing look what i've achieved you want to achieve this you want to work hard like me so we can work hard together we're hard workers we're business people let's make business let's make things happen we make things happen grind grind push push network network my whole philosophy has changed to this is who i am this is what i've done this is what i've been through and that's important is owning my past it used to be Oh, no, I, was, I, I, I didn't even start accepting or telling people that I was homeless and being verbal about it until five years ago. I would hide all that. Are you kidding? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get $10 million to put into something. You're going to tell you I was a homeless person? You think I'm going to tell you that, you know, I've been through these hardships and my father smoked crack cocaine and lost everything? Okay. I was broke five times in my life and have lost everything that I've tried to achieve and have failed so many times that I don't even count anymore. No, I've achieved a lot, so I'm going to throw that out there. But, you know, mm -hmm. I accept, and I, you know, until I accepted all that, until I finally really accepted that and went, okay, this is who I am. But because of that, this is who I am. And I can do all this. And instead of going to the people and saying, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, check this out. You want to be a part of what I got going on. It's, hey, you know what I've done. You know what I can do. You know that I have these passions. What can I do to help you? What can I do to build this for you? What are you trying to achieve? Where can I put myself to help you achieve? And it's not into, and I love talking about this, giving to receive, okay? Mm -hmm. There's giving to give and there's giving to receive. Now, giving to receive is what most people do even most of the time, they're not conscious of it. Oh, I did that for karma. Oh, hey, give me a ride over here. I'll buy you a burger while we're there. We're so used to this giving to receive that we even plant it into people before we even ask for help. You know, mm -hmm. help, the hardest word in the English language, help. So giving to give is when you're truly just like doing stuff to really give. To be like, you know, I know this is going to be better for you. I know this is going to make life better for you. I know this is going to make life better 
for the world. I might not even get affected by how this changes the world and makes it a better place, but I know the world's a little bit better of a place. And when you put yourself in those give the gift situations, when you honestly are there for people, and it's not about even those people. That's what I'm trying to get. Those people don't, it's not like they're going to come help you later. That's what I'm getting at all. That's giving to receive. You do these things. You put yourself in these situations. You put yourself out there. Life just, you know, the Christians call it uh, sowing the seed, you know, and, you know, you got to reap what you sow. In a way, it's that. Mm -hmm. It's these old mentalities, these old ideas of thinking that we look at and we go, oh, that's just hogwash. No, these people have been saying this. There's a reason why people have said this for thousands of years. Yeah, it might be muddled now. Yes, it might be put into a different ideology you don't agree with, but stop for a second. Think that this has been said for thousands of years. Think why has it been said for thousands of years and figure out how that relates to this universe of why it's been said. So like the reap that you sow, you might not believe in Christianity. Who cares? You might not believe in spirituality. Who cares? But let me tell you, what you do in this world and what you do without any, you put that seed and you walk away from that plant. You don't have to water it. You don't have to worry about that plant. That plant is just that plant. It does what it does. You'd be surprised mm -hmm. how much oxygen you have around you to breathe. And that's just like, you know, a metaphor there. There's mm -hmm. so much abundance that comes back your way. It's crazy now. I don't even try and work anymore. I literally sit back and just try every day to offer anything I can to make this world a better place. And mm -hmm. I sit back every month and trip out how much better my life is every month. Month after month, it just gets better and better. And this goes back to the idea of living for the now, mm -hmm. which is like we hear living in the now. And it's like, I live so in the now, it's scary to the point where I don't even know what I'm doing when I wake up that day. <laughs> I literally have to look at my calendar and say, hey, what's, what's going on today? It's not that I don't structure things. I set appointments. I set meetings and stuff. But I don't live by that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm talking to you. You know, you're listening. I'm doing the best that I can in this moment to do what I can with what I know, with what I have. What I, there's a million things I could be doing with my time right now, but I'm doing this. I'm giving it 100% with what I know. This is what I want to do. And I'm going to cap it with this. And that is, if I do that 100% of the time, if I'm always giving 100%, doing the best that I can with the knowledge that I have, and putting myself in place is not just sitting in my bed under the cover scared, but actually doing the footwork and putting myself out there. A, I don't have to worry about the past. I have no regrets at all. Why? Because I did the best I could with the knowledge that I had and the resources that I knew that I could use. Why am I going to beat myself up? That's the best I could do with what I had in the moment. Yeah, if I would have had some other knowledge, maybe I would have had some other thing that I did, but I didn't have that knowledge at that time. I did the best right. that I could. I gave 100%. So boom, past is taken care of. And if I'm putting 100% into the now, I'm not sitting there in my bed, wrapped in a blanket, scared of the world. I'm here. I'm talking to you. Maybe I'm out taking a walk. Who knows what it is? But if I'm putting myself out there and giving 100% of the now of what I can do, I don't need to worry about the future. Because I know mm -hmm. that right now I'm focused on, I want to be a filmmaker. I want people to know that I exist. I want to make an impact on this world. These are all things that I want. And so doing this right now, I'm doing that. Even if there's mm -hmm. 10 people listening or a million people listening, I'm doing that right now. So I don't have to worry about the future because I know the goals that I'm aspiring towards, I'm doing the best in this second for those goals. So I don't have to worry about those goals. It's not like I could be doing something better right now than what I could be doing. Make sense? So yeah, all you absolutely. can do is live right now do right now be right now and build yourself the best future that you can in this second and hope the future works out because you can't control it how did you make that shift in mentality how did you um like was there a moment when you decided you were just gonna like start thinking in that way was there something that affected it and how did you like actually make that change in your head honestly um it's funny no one's asked that question <laughs> um, growing up the way that I did, I grew up with an abusive father. I grew up with a family that screamed at each other. I grew up with all this really hardcore abuse that 
I knew that there was a better way when I started seeing that I myself started reflecting that. Mm. I was abusive. I was angry. I was argumentative. And I started seeing that. And, and I was talking about this the other day. I find a lot of people look at themselves and go, God, I really don't like this about myself. But everyone accepts it, so it's cool. I don't need to work on that. And that's one thing I've never been. If I don't like something about myself, I change that shit. Because I'm in control of me. I'm the only person that can change it. I'm the only one that can make a difference with that situation. So that's one thing and one code I've always stuck next to is that if it's going to change, it's going to be me that changes it. So in seeing that anger in me and seeing that darkness in me and knowing once again that I deserve better, that I can be better, that I'm a nice guy, that I want happiness, that I want joy. I want all these things in my life too. Like we all want. We just don't know how to get them. So that's like I said earlier, I started going, okay, well, I definitely don't want to be abusive. I don't want to be dark. I don't want to be argumentative. I want to settle down now. So I'm thinking about wife. I'm thinking about kids. I don't want to be that person to my children. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be that screaming father, that dark father, that scary father. I I didn't want to be all that. I knew that there was a better way. And so I started looking at, you know, those things i think a lot of the time most people go from a psychological standpoint oh my father was this my you know childhood was hard i'm trying to give up cigarettes you know whatever (laughs) i'm sorry to say it like this if anyone's listening whatever that is that you blame as this reason instead of it it's just it's you Mm -hmm. and i started realizing that you know i could blame all this stuff like everyone else does or i could stop for a second i could look inside and i could go okay what's going on here with you? You know, they always say you can't love someone else till you love yourself, right? Mm -hmm. I've always, I've always stood by that. And, you know, there's a level of spirituality into it. I'm not gonna, you know, front. There's a level of, I was, I was raised by my father who was like a hardcore partier. And then my mom was a hardcore crack to whip Christian. Mm. So I was raised on both sides of the tracks. You know, my father for the beginning of my life until, you know, the crack cocaine came out in the eighties and he lost everything. He kept his drug habit pretty well. So I grew up until I was about six in a very weird life where on the weekdays I would be with my father in the, the mansion with the Mercedes out front. And then the weekends I would be with my mom in her trailer home because he left her with mm-hmm. nothing, wow. you know? So I got to see both sides of the tracks. I got to both see what the rich life was like and what the poor life was like, what a really angry, dark person was like and what a really sweet, nice, you know, she was a Christian. She was cracked with Christian, but she was still a sweet lady. My mom was a Mm -hmm. very, is a very sweet lady. (laughs) You know what I mean? And so in that duality, I think that's where I was kind of lucky. I got to see that duality. I got to see both sides of that. But in saying what my mother was, you know, I was raised with an idea that there is a power greater than myself out there. You know, mm. my mom got sober in the 70s. She was Elvis's hairstylist. She lived at Grayson. Oh, wow. My mom, my mom raged. But by the time I came around, my mom was <laughs> AA sober. Like wow. AA Christian, craft the whip sober. So I grew up at AA and Al-Anon, learned the 12 steps. And, you know, even though alcoholics and alcoholism is, is like this whole entire thing in AA, they do have some pretty good rules and some pretty good guys they live by in order to how to get out of um, addiction or out of bad situations. You know, their first step, which is, I'm not going to get into it all here, but the first step is just re- realizing that, you know, there's a power greater than yourself. And that always stuck with me. Mm-hmm. And through different little weird ways in my life, not through religion, But through different little ways, like growing up as a child, my mom was left with nothing. My dad stripped her of everything and lived the the grand lifestyle until he lost it all and left her with nothing. And she would, every month, pay her rent. This woman had no job. She was on welfare. And the welfare didn't really pay anything. You know, we go on the week. We would spend our Friday sometimes going from our mansion with our dad down to my mom's house. And the first thing she would do is take us to the welfare office to stand on the welfare lines. She would um, sew, sew us jeans and sew us pants and shorts that we would wear. 
my mom was, you know, she tried her best as a woman that, you know, didn't work and didn't have any way to work and was just, you know, pushing along. But I would ask her, like, how the hell did she survive <laughs> all those years? Like, how did you do that without, for one, killing him or killing yourself or killing us or just going psychotically crazy? And she would always <laughs> go the spiritual route. Not that her, it was Christianity and God. But I saw it, like I witnessed that there was something going on in here with what was going on because she would need $75.13 to pay the bills and rent by that month. And she would get a refund check in the mail for 40 bucks from something she forgot about. And she would get uh, someone that would want their hairstyle for 20 bucks. And that woman, <clears throat> God bless her on her knees, would pray and by the end of the month wind up with the exact to the penny that she needed to take care of her bills and her rent and everything. So I witnessed all this. <laughs> I witnessed it and I'd be like, okay. So I asked her at a young age and I was like, okay, well, how, how do you do this? Teach me the ways of the Jedi. Like, what's up? <laughs> she's like, okay, well, I think the first thing she told me, it was in like my early teens. She's like, okay, well, you can't just pray to God and just sit in your bed and sleep all day. You gotta get out there. You gotta do the footwork. God can't help you if you're not helping yourself. So I was like, okay, cool. <clears throat> That's when I got off the streets and I, you know, I stopped, you know, doing, I started working and you know, looking for jobs. I realized I wasn't going to die by the time I was 21. So I probably should get my life together. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I got off the streets, I got an apartment, I got like things going on, you know, and then I called and I was like, yo, uh, this is cool. I'm in my early twenties. I got an apartment. I got a bed I sleep on, but um, like, this sucks. I'm like a little 400 square foot apartment. Like I'm throwing these raves and clubs and I hate this stuff. And I'm just over this lifestyle. And she's like, well, are you praying? Are you like, and, and I'm going to associate this for you people that aren't religious. Are you putting it out there in the universe? Like, are you, <laughs> whether you call it affirming manifestation, praying, <laughs> are you, are you doing these things to, and instead of God will go to the first step is this, the universe, the energy, you know, you're putting it out there in the universe of what you want. And I was like, okay, okay, cool. Cool. So I started, you know, praying, affirming, because I affirm also, I believe in new age stuff, but, and then things started changing. I got into films and I started doing film stuff and doing really cool like that. And I was like, okay, right on. This stuff, this stuff works, this praying stuff. And then I got into like my early thirties and I'm like, okay, ma, I mean, I'm doing really good here, but I hate my entire life. I'm like sitting in paradise, but it feels like everyone else's dream and I'm not happy. I, I hate everyone. I hate my wife, my life, my, my, my job, my crew, my everything. I just, this is not it. She's like, and this is so where it gets a little religious. I'm sorry, we're going to get a little tiny religious here, but it's only if you make it religious because this is just a fact, you know, this isn't about religion. So she goes, well, did you, you know, accept that Jesus Christ has, you know, come to save you? I'm like, look, ma, I wasn't there. I'm not going to say it wasn't happen. I'm not going to say it did happen. You know, I'm not a religious person. Sorry, not my gig. And she's like, well, you know, just think about it. You know, in your prayers, just just think about telling God that you want to meet Jesus. And I was like, I don't want to meet Jesus. She's like, I'm like, I don't want to be walking down the street and all have Jesus come up to me and like, I'm like crazy and having all kinds of stuff going. She's like, oh, I've met him twice. I'm like, okay, Ma, come on. I'm getting crazy. She goes, no, just do it, right? And this is where it gets really weird. So when I graduated college, I met a guy, Joseph Logley, who was in the film school and had missed his graduation, somehow slept through it, and ended up at my graduation to get his, his <laughs> awards. He had, he had heard me on stage. I was the first valedictorian the school ever named. I got a GPA 4.0 blue and yellow lanyards like the whole nine yards like I like I, said, I focused on school because I was like oh I never thought I'd get to go to college and now I'm going to college I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this right <laughs> and uh so I met Joseph and Joseph was a 6'3 white guy from south side Chicago who was let's just say uh very hardcore <laughs> talk like macho randy man savage oh yeah june i'm telling you we're gonna have a good one and uh he was you know living down in compton in like really seedy motels and i don't even know why this guy came into my life but he came into my life and he just wanted to do sound 
So I had him on. I, I couldn't get a hold of a sound guy for my first short after school that I started shooting. I remembered him, called him. He came up, worked on it for me. Told me he loved watching me behind the camera, loved my passion, wanted to work with me again. Somehow we just started talking and linking up. And, you know, he started getting his life together, started realizing that what he was doing wasn't good for him, got himself a wife and started, you know, the CD thing started getting a little bad. And um, so I started to show him how to be a producer. And I started to show him how to be a producer, like, this is how you produce. And we go out to film festivals. So I was, you know, doing the film festival circuit at the time. And, and I'd be like, you got to wake up early. You got to get there early. And I was just really <laughs> pushing him and bugging him to go hard. And... One day we're sitting there after the Nashville Film Festival that one of the nights, like, you have to wake up the next day early, man. We got to be there early. It's a producer's job and network and meet people. He's like, bro, I'm going to be there after lunch. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? I just had a speech and what? He goes, yeah, I met this really rich guy. He owns like farms and restaurants and all kinds of stuff. And he invited me to lunch tomorrow. <laughs> like really rich guy, huh? He's like, yeah, dude, I think he wants to put money in the films. I'm like, bro, maybe you're not a producer maybe you're an executive producer. He goes, what's that? I'm like, that's the guy that gets the money. He's like, I love getting the money. I can get money. And then Joe went into that. So Joe executive produced my last film. Oh, that's wow. just a little backstory on how I met Joe. But Joe, like I said, got off, his, got off being all crazy, got off, you know, the whole drug thing, that's, you know, got his life together, married this really sweet Russian girl cat, got his life together, got, and started going to church and stuff like that. So He's telling me, this is after my mom tells me, you know, you got to get worded up with Jesus. Like, what's up with Jesus? And I'm like, I'm not religion. I'm not down for Christianity. So Joe's like telling me, oh, no, 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 dude. Jesus, bro. You got to get down with, oh, yeah, Jesus, bro. <laughs> and he's like, you got to watch this documentary. This documentary came out called, um, it was called A Case for Christ. And it was a New York Times bestselling author a Pulitzer Prize winner, published guy was a serious investigative journalist. His wife had became a Christian and he thought that Christianity was going to break their marriage up. So he went on a two year mission to prove Jesus Christ didn't exist. And if you watch this documentary, right? He's like, you got to watch this documentary. I'm like, okay, whatever, bro. He's like over at my house. I pull it up on my TV I, I pull up, I'm like, is this the one you're talking about? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. I pause. I'm like, I'm going to stop. I'm like, okay, I'm like, I'll watch this later. Okay, cool. Right on. Made him happy. I turned my TV off. I'm not joking. I turned my TV off. Um, at the end of the night, it's probably like one, no, it's probably about, at this time, it's like probably two thirty, three o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to lay on the couch here and just kind of see if I could fall asleep. I'm laying there on the couch in the pitch black and boom, blaring voice. I'm like, what the hell is going on right now? This voice is, where is this? I'm like, you know, when like something loud happens when you're, when you're like laying in the dark, you pop up, you get, what's going on here? I'm like, is that coming from the TV? Because my sound bar works separate from my television, you know, it's all like uh, yeah. broadcasting stuff. So I turned my TV on and the case for Christ had started playing. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's weird. But you know what? Whatever. I'm going to just leave it on in the background. I'll close my eyes again. I'll just listen to it as I lay here to see if it's cool or not. <laughs> 4.45 in the morning. I am crying. <laughs> you. I am crying because this guy just did a whole documentary. I thought he's trying to prove this so he can like not lose his marriage to some crazy psychopath Christian. And by the time the fucking things end, he looks at the, by the time it's over, he looks at the camera and goes, well, you know, after everything that I've, I've researched and looked at, you know, there's about a 4% chance that this person didn't exist. And he starts naming off the things that we believe in that have way more than a percentage chance of 4% then that it does, you know, that isn't real, it doesn't exist. Like things we truly believe in. He's like, no. <laughs> If it's only 4%, I'm just going to have to tell you, I have to believe that this guy existed and that he did what he did. <laughs> and that's when I was like, okay, you know what? I don't have to say he was God on earth. I don't get all that. But this guy really did exist. Mm -hmm. And he really did what he did. Okay, so now that I know that's the reality, 
how can the, this is where the science comes in? Because I told you I'm not, you know, it's a religious science. How can I look mm-hmm. at this from a standpoint that I can understand? And I started thinking of Jesus Christ as a quantum physicist. Okay, mm-hmm. going where, and I'll give you an example where most people think, oh, I am the son of Jesus, or I'm the son of God because uh, I do this, you can do this because you are the son of God too. And if you look at that from a quantum scientific ideology, it is there is this power and this is the universe and there's this energy and I am tapped into it just as you are created and tapped into this energy also. Look what I can do because I am tapped into this energy you could do this too. And I think people take the word God and put some kind of Christian uh, Catholic ideology of a guy in a beard on a cloud living in behind some golden gates when God is just a word. Whether you say God, energy, the big bang, the first spark, you know, the ones and zeros that make up, it's just a word, an idea. You don't have to think of a, person in a white cloth on a cloud, you know, in Birkenstocks. <laughs> <laughs> so once you break it down like that and it's just become scientific and you start looking at people like Eckhart Tolle and you start looking at people like, um, gosh, there's so many people that I can, <laughs> you know, uh, what are they? The uh, Abraham. And here's the thing is there's a lot of kooky stuff too. Don't forget you're getting this new age thinking through people that can't scientifically prove it. So everyone's going to kind of have their own opinion and their own way. But Mm -hmm. I think I've done a pretty good job at tapping into what I believe is how this world works. You know, I was at a bar today and this guy comes up and he sits at the bar and he's like a wreck. He's a mess. Like what's wrong, man? He's like, Oh, you know, doctor just told me I'm schizophrenic. I hear these voices, man. They're everywhere. And I keep it under control sometimes, but it's really bad right now. And I look at him and I go, you know, let me ask you a question. No, actually, the question came first. We were talking about something. So let me ask you a question. What has stress or worry ever accomplished? What has ever been solved by stress and worrying? Like, what? Give me one example. One example of a situation where you stressed about it and it made it better, or you worried about it and it <laughs> solved it. Just give me one. If you can name one, I will buy you a <laughs> shot of any whiskey you want in the bar. I don't care how much a shot it is. Name me one. So this guy starts telling me, well, I just found out I'm a schizophrenic. My doctor just diagnosed me, and that's why I'm here flipping out and not having a good day. I was like, wow, man, that's heavy. But let me ask you something. Does worrying about it make you even better? (laughs) Is stressing about hearing these voices make it any better? He goes, no, it doesn't. I go, there you go. (laughs) I still bought him a shot, but. (laughs) You're speaking to me right now because I'm a very big stressor and worrier. And I have to get told that all the time. And it's not going to do anything for you. Nothing for you. Zero. Nothing. All I do is stress and (laughs) Once you learn that. And once you learn that that it does nothing for you, you almost just start laughing at everything. You're just like, (laughs) I sometimes look at my wife and I ask her, I'm like, am I too carefree? Do I live too much in the now? Like, sometimes I think like I should be stressing about stuff. Maybe I should be upset about stuff. Maybe I should be tripping about the future and worried about the mistakes I've made in the past. But I mean, honestly, I mean, honestly, I spend every freaking day happy i don't have bad days i don't get angry or upset i might get frustrated i'm a human being i get frustrated here and there Mm -hmm. but i don't get angry i don't get upset i don't have bad i can't remember the last bad day that i had actually i can't the last bad 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 day that i had what's today we're looking at the 10th of november 2021 was Mm -hmm. december 6th 2019 and that's because i got strong armed robbed two guys came in my house robbed me and shot me oh my god and let me tell you before that i can't even tell you another bad day that i had Jeez. i mean yes i my life is very weird and very abstract i live in los angeles i'm known to have money 
Uh, it's something that I'm trying to change about my life, which is why I'm really loving the film world and really getting deep into it right now. Because as a screenwriter, I can be anywhere. Uh, you know, I can get out of this city finally. You know, people always talk about coming to Los Angeles. This city is, it's hard. Mm-hmm. It's a grind. It's dangerous. There's a lot of people out there that aren't doing good. There's a lot of people that hate on people that are doing good. Mm-hmm. Um, it's expensive as hell. breakfast is twenty dollars if you want to go out somewhere um it's just a very very tough and hard city so when it gets down to like the mental health of it you have to prime yourself in a way to deal with the negativity that is out there and shove in your face on a constant basis and Mm -hmm. if you don't you really you're just gonna you just get dragged down you get dragged so easy to get dragged down into it and i don't have the patience for a roller coaster life i don't have mm-hmm. the patience to be happy one second and mad the next and happy the one second and mad the next it is so exhausting oh yeah so exhausting it really is you know and uh <laughs> but once you learn that once you learn this listen to what we're talking about let's, let's just really break this down for a second worrying doesn't solve nothing stress doesn't solve anything all this is very exhausting i mean Let's let's stop for a second. Who wants to live like that? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't. I know I don't. I mean, there might be some goth people out there and some like really like heavy metal people are like, yeah, this is this is, this is life. <laughs> Being in pain is cool, and that's like you know. But I mean, honestly, you give me a break. That's just a <laughs> terrible way to go through this universe. <laughs> there is so much beauty. There was so, I had a friend the other week who told me he wanted to kill himself. And for an hour, we talked. And by the end of it, I'm like, bro, let me just do me a favor. Before you do that, whatever money you have left, hop in whatever you can, drive south. Go into Mexico and just keep going south. Drink in bars, party your butt off, have a great time. At the end of it, if you, when you're broke and you wind up on some beach somewhere, at least you live life the best you could and then do whatever you want to do. But give it one more hoorah for me, bro. Just give me one more hoorah. You started laughing and we worked our way out of it. There you go. Well, you know, I, I wish I did because this is not a visual thing. It's, a, it's an audio thing, but there's a really good example. And I'll try and do it over audio. Let's see if I can achieve this of living in the now. Okay, so... Think in your head of a timeline. Okay, here's your timeline. It's a straight, you know, a line. Don't, don't overcomplicate this. You get your timeline, right? And in the beginning, you were born, put a dot there. At the end, you die. Boom, there's another dot, right? Now let's put a, a little line on. It's a little tiny line on that timeline. That's where we're at right now, okay? Most people look at life like, oh, this is where my line is, and Look at what's happened in the past to that first dot when I was born and look what's going to happen. So worried about what's going to happen to that next dot. And here I am on this line. You see the beginning, you see the end. And you're like, God help me. What a terrifying <laughs> reality that is, right? <laughs> but here's the thing is that we're all living on the wrong timeline. We're all living in the wrong place. Okay. Mm. Now let's take that little slash of a line and let's stretch it out to infinity both ways. Okay. That's the now. Right now, you can do anything you want. I can strip my clothes off and go run down Santa Monica Boulevard naked. (laughs) I could walk over to my fridge and take the bottle of vodka out and drink the whole thing down. I could go in and kiss my girlfriend. I could do anything. I can hang up the phone on you. (laughs) Anything is possible. So that, (laughs) instead of looking at that dot and that dot and look at this little microscopic, little tiny, minute little thing, and going oh this is what I'm dealing with I look at it in that other line this now line it's an infinite possibility of ideas of what I could do in this second (laughs) I mean life is amazing in that second like you could literally do Mm -hmm. anything you know I mean literally I think a lot of people get confused on you can do anything I know we don't think so but we really can. Like you might end up in jail or you might end up meeting <laughs> someone that will change your life. You don't know, but you can do it. You can go in either direction. <laughs> it really can, but I'll tell you this. I'd rather take the possibility of it going in either direction than sitting here depressed, staring at, you know, the wall, thinking about how bad everything is or how good, you know, how good Absolutely. everything should be. Because what is that in the end? It's all perspective. 
And that's what we beat right. ourselves up over is perspective. And that's the worst part about it is that <laughs> we look at things like so big and so crazy. Like, it's perspective. And we then look at things and go, okay, oh my gosh, this is so big. But really, like, think of the biggest thing that you can think of on this earth, like the biggest, tallest skyscraper that you can think of, or the biggest cruise boat, whatever the hell it is, okay? <laughs> and now think of outer fucking space. <laughs> think about outer space, right? I mean, think about how huge this universe is and how a speck, a dust speck that thing you think is so big is in comparison to what's really going on in this world, you know? It's, yeah, it's so insignificant. <laughs> it really is, and everything's like that. But that's not to say that we are insignificant. Because right. here's the thing is, what is significance? Once again, we're back in perspective, mm-hmm. right? And if I told you that there was a beach out there with a million billion grains of sand, but there is one grain in there that's a, just like all the rest, but when you eat it, you'll have eternal life. That's a pretty special grain of sand. It's still just a grain of sand. But that <laughs> grain of sand is an amazing, epic little component of this universe. And really, it's just about perspective. You're done. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. I think that's the <laughs> way that I keep my sanity at this point. That and the fact that I've really, truly learned. I don't want to say this wrong, but the less harder you work towards pushing things the more things actually come for you Mm. that makes sense yeah like the like the less you force it type of thing it's gonna come to you they say whenever you're looking for love you don't find it when you're not looking for it that it happens right that's true about everything it's (laughs) not just love it's not just love and the distraction that I found and this is the best part about it the distraction that I found because you're like okay how am I supposed to keep my mind off of all this stuff going on then like come on like that's impossible what am I supposed to do you know what you do you focus on yourself and making yourself cool and yourself a good person and yourself a spiritual awakened spirit in this world take all that time you worry about all that stuff and you just make yourself good because in the end and this is the craziest stuff when there, it's funny because we're kind of going full circle here we're getting down to the licks of it what that does is then we get to the point of ego and we've been talking about this yes. you know ego and letting go of ego and that brings us down to a very very crazy thing and now we're like here we're now this is where i'm at right now which is the newest thing i'm practicing which is this revelational idea of the observer okay Mm. what the observer is (laughs) this is crazy so the observer you know we all talk about a spirit or a soul you know that kind of thing the observer now imagine an observer right so i am the observer that is inside of judah ray I am the observer that is going through Judah Ray's life experience. I am the observer that's watching what Judah Ray sees. And I'm the observer that has conversations with Judah Ray about it all. And what I mean by that is that voice you have in your head that we all have. And we all go, that's so funny. I argue with myself. Oh, I was just having a conversation with myself. Oh, you know, and you think you're just kind of debating in your head ideas That's the observer. That's you. And what Mm. we call I. Okay, we'll call it I. That is you having a discussion. That is me having a discussion, my observer having a discussion with Judah. Because my observer is listening to the stupidity that Judah is saying in my head and going, (laughs) nah, dude, this is the way it is. And Judah's going, nah, bro, come on. (laughs) I'm a human. I want to do this and that. And the observer's going, man, I don't know, bro. Think about this. And you're like, no, no, no. But yo, think about that. No, no. What about this? That's the observer (laughs) having a conversation with Judah Ray. I'm using myself as an example here. And what that brings you to is I and me. Okay. So me, me is everything that makes up me. My way I look, the way I act, how I talk, you know, what I do for a living, my house, the way I dress. This is all me. 
I am Judah, the person that's talking to you right now. I am Judah, the person living in this moment and, you know, actually experiencing everything that we're, we're both going through right now, right? That is I. And what that mentality brings around is no matter what happens to me, you can take my car, you can take my looks, you can take my arm. You can take all these things from me. I am still I. I am still Judah Ray. I'm a good person. I try hard. I love. I care. I have passion. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I don't feel like I am still I. Nothing anyone does in this world can affect I. Because I mm. control I. And once you understand that I control I, that I control how happy I am. I control whether I'm enjoying this life experience, I control what I do. And the rest is all just me. Once you get a really good grasp of that, you can almost sit back and kind of laugh at what's happening to me. Because no matter what, you can hurt me. You can take stuff away from me. That all just affects me. Listen to what that simple statement is. That affected me. That hurt me. These, these words that we use in language, we all think that they just convey simple sentences so that people can understand us but really within that structure years and years and centuries and millennia ago whenever it was created you know this this dialect and this way of talking they who built this structure said for a reason this is why you use me here this is a reason why you use i here this is the reason why you use you there mm. and once you start realizing that that no matter what you can try and you know, kill me. You can do all these things to me, no matter what, I will never be affected. And there's a mm. reason why we talk these ways. There's a reason for everything that we do. When you start learning that kind of stuff, it just starts tripping you out. Right. It really does it. You know, why do we use terms? Why do we do certain things? Why do we, <laughs> oh, it's, it's endless. <laughs> it's so endless. Like I'll give you a great example. <laughs> We'll close it. We'll cap this part with this example, right? So vowels and consonants. We're raised and we're taught, you know, oh, vowels are vowels, consonants are consonants. You use consonants here, you use vowels there. This is what a vowel does. This is what a consonant does. And this is what... So when you use a vowel, A-E-I-O-U, you are using the vibration of your vocal cords in your throat to create the sound. When you use a consonant, you are pushing air through your mouth S, T, P. This has nothing to do. Feel when you say those letters. It has nothing to do with your vocal cords. It's all about pushing that air through your mouth is what creates those sounds. Mm. That's what I'm talking about. You see what I mean? Yeah. Knowing why we do what we do down to the, down to just the core of it. And, you know, knowing that when you say the rule of thumb, oh, that's the rule of thumb that that comes from back in the days people could beat their their wives with a switch as long as it wasn't wider than their thumb oh wow i didn't know that see that's what i mean knowing these small <laughs> little things and that's a bad example i was just trying to be smart and cute about like how we use <laughs> terms and things that we have no idea where they come from but that ideology is you know and it, it resonates back to what i was saying if there's a term that's been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years. <laughs> you might want to think about why that saying has lasted <laughs> as long as it has. You might not agree with exactly. it. Take it in the context that that exists for a reason. You know? <laughs> so just that. It's not like a week ago someone wrote, you know, you find love when you're not looking for it. John wrote that on Twitter like three days ago. <laughs> no, this is something he's been saying for centuries. There's a reason. <laughs> Just think about it for a second. Take it into consideration. <laughs> Maybe even try it for a month or something. Let's see if there's some kind of realism to what people are saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you might find happiness. If you don't, at least you know you try and it Yeah, at least you, you tried it. People. You can talk smack and be like, oh, yeah, dude, that's, I, that doesn't work. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. you know, you, you got that. If you work up the worst, at least you got that. But best comes to best, you become happy. Ooh, sounds like a good trade-off <laughs> to me. You either get to be happy 
or be a complete pompous jerk in someone's face <laughs> and be as negative as you can about a situation. Win win. Win win. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, Judah, it has been so fun listening to you and hearing your story and this advice and everything you've given is like next level. I did not expect coming into this to have such a deep conversation. And it's been really, really inspiring for me because I am a stressor and worrier. So I'm taking everything you said into my life now. And I'm what's stressing going to do for me? <laughs> really? Yep. <laughs> take all that, not only that, but then take that energy you put towards stressing and try doing something productive with it. <gasps> that last 45 minutes you just spent stressing, if you would have done something productive with those 45 minutes, I bet you that thing you're stressing about would have been a little better. <laughs> you're right. You're totally right. I can't argue that one. I can't be the pompous jerk that argues that back at you. Yeah, so just, just work on that. I'm telling you, that is like a number one, people. <laughs> Stress and worrying do nothing but screw up your life. Really, it's. And anybody, I invite you, if you can find me online, very easy to find. Instagram, Judah period Ray. You can find me on Facebook. You can Google me and find me. Anyone out there, I challenge you, if you can find something that was solved by worrying or stress, I will literally, you have no idea the grand prize that you will receive because you will have blown my mind because I've been thinking for a very long time and I can't come up with a single thing that worrying or stressing makes better. So I challenge anyone listening to that. My lines are always open. Please. <laughs> You'll be the first to know if I find an answer for that. Please. <laughs> just anything. Just nothing. I just can't find value in it. Uh, you're anyway, not wrong. This has been a great combo. Thank you so much for your time and this great experience. Wow, Judy, you have so much wisdom to share with the world, and I feel so honored to have had the chance to speak with you. You are truly an inspiration and someone who I think we can all learn from. Listeners, thank you for joining us today, and please don't forget to share this episode with your loved ones, especially those that may need this extra dose of inspiration. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our weekly newsletter to stay connected with us here at Go Ahead Tell Me. Talk to you soon.